I'm delighted to be here today with Gavin Ashenden. And uh, Gavin is, uh, well, I'd, I'd like to have you tell a little bit about your background, Gavin. Again, I mean, you've been on the show a couple of times, but just very briefly, um, you are Catholic now because of conversion. But what were you doing just before that? And, um, and then I'll get us, I'll introduce us into what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I suppose a haiku biography would be that um, <laughs> I, I, I thought I was going to be a lawyer. Uh, I, in the middle of my training as a lawyer, I, I be, was converted at a university mission. Um, I then found myself under pressure to become an Anglican clergyman, which I didn't want to do very much because I didn't like them. Uh, and I did want to be a lawyer, but, but I then spent... 35, 40 years um, as one. And I spent 10 years as a parish priest. I did some more more, more degrees, um, ended up as a, a lecturer in the psychology of religion and a chaplain at a, our most radical university for 25 years. Uh, I did a few other things like Bible smuggling in the Soviet Union, getting caught by the KGB and interrogated rather unkindly. Um, several times, which which is one of the things that prepared me to fight cultural Marxism, because um, having had a, having had the experience of economic Marxism and totalitarianism and, and having like Jordan Peterson uh, read Solzhenitsyn from beginning to one end to the other and back again, uh, I had a sense of what the issues were and why they were important. Um, though I had no idea that in the last, well, about 10 years ago, I began to get an idea of what was coming and was shocked by it. And, and also shocked because I could see no way of putting on the brake or turning the steering wheel. And the trajectory that, that I thought we were on 10 years ago, which is, which is proved correct, was, was very alarming. So about that point, I realized that, um, uh, that cancellation, the, end of, the ending of freedom of speech, the end of freedom of conscience was going to be what we faced and I needed to resigned from my faculty position before I was cancelled, uh, which I did, and then found myself exercising uh, my, my ministry in public. And it, it took a surprise turn. Um, I was propelled into the public space when I complained about the Quran being read at an Epiphany Mass in an Anglican cathedral, I should say an Epiphany Communion service. Um, and, uh, uh, and then to my surprise, I've, I found myself being thrust into the public limelight. I... I'm too um I'm cynical isn't the right word. I'm 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 too uh skeptical to want to push myself forward for a role in the public space because I pride myself on being able to see at least two sides of every problem and maybe four sides. Uh and so I'm not a natural um gladiator for the truth in the public space, but I found myself being 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 pushed in that direction um, and um, being rather surprised by it, and uh, indeed, when I became a Catholic, I thought, well, I'm I'm starting at the beginning again. Um, so, so uh, in between there, you left the Anglican Church because of some issues within the Anglican. Yes. Okay. Well, there were two stages. I I left the Church of England because of um, I'd I'd given a lot of in 1981. Uh, a fairly senior priest uh, asked if somebody would debate him over the ordination of women. Uh, and I had no views at all about it, um, but no one wanted to do it. So I said, well, I'll do it as an exercise. And I, I read about it and thought about it. And as I, as I did, it seemed to me this was a very complex area and everything depended upon your presuppositions. Um, and also that there were, there were spiritual or metaphysical implications to what we were talking about in a way that really wasn't at all obvious. Um, and so I then thought, well, I'll watch this and see how it works out. Uh, who knows what the right decision is? And one of the things I saw taking place was, first of all, a, a an exercise in, in gender power politics without any theological or spiritual language or analysis. So that was the first thing that worried me. Why are we, why are we changing the way the church is um, for a political argument? or really an exercise in power. Uh, and, you know, that that requires you to look at, at feminism, first wave feminism, and then second wave, and then third wave, and all the spin-off and the implications of that. 
Um, and I began to think this is not really about women and priesthood. This is about something much more profound and far more significant. And, you know, I wished I'd known now what we know then. I'd been able, I would have been able to say, well, you know, we are going to condemn um, hundreds of thousands of distressed teenagers to, to biological mutilation because we're going to construct a world in which reality is what your imagination wants it to be. And if I'd said that 20 years ago, people would have said, well, that would be terrible. Surely we would never do that. How is it possible that a politician could not ask the, answer the question, what is a woman? How is it possible that on national television, biology gets junked? <laughs> that, I mean, we've come to a... So, so what, I'm, what I'm saying is that what began as a very simple debate about things that we assumed uh, we knew about in the 1980s have turned out to produce uh, anarchy and distress today. And so I'm justifying the fact that I had hesitations about them and, and interrogated them as they developed. Um, um, I had a somewhat similar experience um, as I came to, I came to faith in Christ in 1980. And uh, at the same time I got elected to the legislature, in 1980, part of the part of what led me to both of them was a bunch of research that I had been doing about things that I saw happening in the culture that really concerned me. And just one of those things was this idea that the schools needed to be preparing good global citizens for the new world order. Wow. <laughs> and uh, so at the time I was trying to alert people to this in 1980, and they all thought oh I goodness. was crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but partly because I had done so much research on it, I could see, as you said, I could see beyond what that particular thing was, that there were many deep implications to that. And uh, one of the deep implications to that, which has certainly come true, is that we've lost the concept of the value of the individual and gone completely to the idea that the state is the, the center of everything and not the individual. And um, <laughs> which turns out to be one of the big criticisms that people were making about Jordan Peterson in that tweet. That's this discussion for everybody who hasn't figured it out by now is about the, the Twitter spat that Jordan Peterson had with uh, Pope Francis. Well, at least, that's the way people viewed it as a, as a spat with Pope okay. Francis. But one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is that I have a number of friends that are within this little corner of the internet where I operate um, who are very much opposed to the idea that salvation can be individual in the way that Jordan Peterson was talking about it and um, much more on the side of what they would call personalism. And they're very opposed to the idea of Jordan Peterson's criticism of social justice because they said this is just the Pope using the terminology about Catholic social teaching. And, um, and these folks are more on the side of what they would call distributism, not socialism, but distributism. So a lot of these things are... Um, arguments that I'm not familiar with because I am not in the Catholic world, but I'm very interested in them. And so I thought maybe you could shed some light on those things. Um, so I thought it might help to get started if we look at the, the uh, Twitter um, argument that Jordan Peterson was making and kind of take it apart and have you analyze different sections of it. Would that work? Sure. Yeah. Was there anything you wanted to say before we got started? Yes, I I think so. I mean, we, we can certainly do that. But the, the caveat before we do that is um, that, that we'll, if you like, we'll be repeating the error. We'll be, we'll, we, we will be repeating the same error that our opponents are making. Because um, essentially what people do is they start with their conclusion and then they work backwards. So the people who are against Peterson and, and pro Pope social justice, they're, they're not there because they've read the Twitter, that they've read the tweet, and they've worked their way through the issues. You know, what are the issues? The issues are well. Uh, so here, here we have two, 
to either competing or complementary concepts and how do they work together? That's the first question. But they're not asking that or recognizing that. They're saying, I know what the answer is and I'm going to prove to you that I'm right and you're wrong. And worse than that, I'm good and you're bad. Well, let's not even begin that process. What is, you know, that, there's so much wrong with that. Let, let's instead say that, uh, of course, it, it's perfectly the, true that there are some people who presented the approach that Peterson did, who have done it in a clumsy and inaccurate way with very serious consequences to their clumsiness. So, yes, there's a whole history of, of people who've pressed forward for individual salvation as if people existed in a bubble without any relationships to anybody else. Whereas, in fact, we know that both in time and space, uh, literally in time, forwards and backwards, and in space, we, we're in a, a web of profoundly complex relationships. So, again, we mustn't have a conversation that, that pretends that we don't know those things. But what we're really being asked to do, we're being asked to do two things. We're being asked to rate a, rate a hierarchy of values and open the box. What's inside the box? So the Pope or the Pope's Twitter feed presented us with a box of social justice. Well, OK, so what, what happens when you look at social justice? Well, there are, there are two narratives. I mean, one narrative is uh, the whole narrative, I would say, of, of Christian compassion down the ages, when the church has, has like no other agency, has gone out to, uh, to give traction to the idea of loving your neighbor practically. Well, you have to do that. It's in the Gospels, and it's obvious. But at the same time, the language the Pope used is also the language of the gulags and of the Soviet Union. It's, it's the same language. So what are these words attached to? Who's got control over them? Who's going to tweak them and move them? Is it, is it going to be? And I think the reason why, for example, I'm on Peterson's side at the moment is I don't see these words as being tweaked or controlled or owned by the Christian church. I see them being tweaked, controlled and owned by the New World Order people who are trying to, who are part of the project to replace the individual with the state, who are part of the project of taking away our free speech, who are part of the project of attacking Christian values we have received them. The problem is the Pope has chosen the enemy's words. Now, why are they the enemy's words? Well, only in this present context, at this present moment, are they the enemy's words. Um, and, and it's not automatic. It's a matter of, well, it's a matter of discernment. Where does the control lie? Who, who tweaks them? And I think what Peterson was trying to say was, I'm sure he would say this, in 2023, at this particular juncture, given the struggles that there are for reorder or reordering society, given the struggles there are between individualism and the state, between freedom of conscience and groupthink, uh, between the new world order that you were so familiar with and, and, and if you like, you know, uh, Huxley's hero in Brave New World. What do these words represent? You, we have to put them in that context. And in that context, the words the Pope used were very dangerous. They were the enemy's words. They were the words that will take away the freedom and the integrity of the church. And Peterson just went, what do you think you're doing? And inviting well, us to read. This, this is one of the reasons I wanted to take it apart a little bit because for me, the first flag was social justice. <clears throat> right. Because let's start with <laughs> let's start with that. Yeah, because in the old days, there was just justice. I mean, the right. biblical word is justice. So I I had a little <clears throat> Twitter spat of my own with several of these friends of mine about. Why on earth do you need to add a word in front of justice to define it as social justice? Because yeah, but, but hang on, but, but, but even even before you get that, justice is very problematic because the context is everything. So if if you if you come and steal my house and you persuade a lawyer to forge the documents and take it away from me, I might say I want justice. But when I stand before God on the last day, yes, <laughs> I tell you, I don't want justice. <laughs> <laughs> so my relationship with justice is highly contextualized, and it isn't enough to say justice is a good word. Justice I, can I be. Remember, I, I remember driving past a sign out in front of a uh, of a Unitarian church one time, and the sign said, "All we want is justice." And I thought, "Oh, oh, you don't know no. what you're saying." <laughs> you know, no, no, I, mean, I should. I want mercy. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Right. So so we have to go back. I, I mean, I don't mean to patronize you, please forgive me, but it's not even enough to start to start with justice. I mean, and, and once again, I mean you're you're doing this in an old-fashioned way, with all due respect. But but the approach that you and I would want would want to do, it's been trumped by postmodernism. You don't own the word justice. Also, you don't own any of the words. You have no authority to tell me what the word means or what it should mean. It's nothing to do with you. And and, and so, again, we have this, uh, you know, in the postmodern context. Uh, in fact, all you're doing is exercising one degree of power play over me, who is exercising, you know, the, the whole enterprise that we've engaged, we're engaging in has been flawed. And I think we we, so the first thing you have to do is to to agree on the rules with the person you're talking to, and and in, and the problem with Twitter spats is that's the last thing anybody does. All we do is say I'm right, you're wrong, I'm good, you're bad, and that's all that happens. Nothing nothing happens beyond that. So- well, I mean, I I do want to say that within the little world I inhabit in on Twitter, um, we have wonderful conversations with one another, and um, and people are very caring and um, open in these discussions and so it, it's not your typical twitter spat um you bet it's not. And, I was going and, to say. And part of the reason that i asked you to talk about this with me gavin is that i think you and i are coming from the same presumptions so we can start from the same presumptions but i have um very um faithful viewers who are really interested in understanding issues from the broad scope. And, and I think it's perfectly, in my mind, it's perfectly legitimate to look at some of these questions and um, expose them for what they are. And I mean, just give, let me give you an example. Um, in, the, in, the, in the Pope's remarks, he said, social justice demands that we fight against the causes of poverty. Okay, that's a loaded, <laughs> That's a loaded but, statement. But if, but if you're Jordan, if you're Jordan Peterson, so the two people who would have problems with that are Jesus and Jordan Peterson. Jesus would have problems with it because he said you'll always have the poor with you, and putting the poor first is is well, okay. It was in the context of of, um, of of his anointing, but but essentially what Jesus is saying there is poverty is not a simple single issue. So so it's just not enough to say. Let's do something with the poor. I mean, well, no, no. But there, let's let's look at the word though. There, the causes of poverty. So, my question is, from your perspective, what are the causes of poverty? Apparently, so, the Pope has so a much different perspective on what the causes of poverty are, and he lists them. He lists them in this uh, in this tweet that he put out: inequality, lack of labor, land, and lodging, and people who deny social and labor rights. No, but with, there are with, really with, many other causes of poverty besides those, right? Okay, but he's not saying they're the causes. They are the symptoms of poverty. They are the expressions of poverty. If you want, what is the cause of poverty? Well, the first thing you then have to do is to say, what are my terms of reference? Am I speaking as a politician? As I, am I speaking as a historian? Am I speaking as a psychologist? Or am I speaking as a Christian? If you speak as a Christian, the cause of poverty is sin. So then deal with sin. What's the answer to sin? Salvation. Peterson's right. Peterson was speaking as a Christian. The Pope, or whoever was running the Pope's Twitter account, was using the language of the social activist, which is not the lang- which is not theological language. So we're talking about what, what Peterson was really doing was, was calling whoever works the Pope's Twitter account back to theology and away from away from politics. Well, what you said, I think, hit the nail on the head when you said the cause of poverty is sin. <clears throat> I mean, sin has many ramifications in the world, but but the cause is sin. But some people, the people who see the causes of poverty as inequality and the lack of labor, land, and lodging, and those who deny social and labor rights, they're putting all the sin on. Um, they're putting all the sin on those guys, those people over there not on me and and they're putting all the sin on on the guy in the suit and the the bad people who do all these things rather than actually am i am i if i'm poor am i poor because of his sin or my sin or is there a little bit of both who defines what poor is 
I mean, even the politicians can't agree on that. So this is a ludicrous conversation to have. No one agrees on the same terms. But the other problem here is that there is a kind of trajectory through the life of the church into the life of the state, and no one quite knows at what point they're talking about. There's a wonderful moment when um, uh, who was the who was the um, the martyr. Um, his name will come to me in a moment. It was about the fourth century. There was a persecution, and um, the state thought that the church had uh, a lot of gold and bullion, and so and so the, the emperor of the time said to the church in Rome, uh, "You need to hand over your treasure, and um, and we're going to force you to." So so the bishop of Rome said, "Okay, you can have our treasure," and then and then they met, and the treasure was a thousand widows and orphans and hungry and naked people because these were the people the church had been feeding. Why? Because, because the secular state didn't recognize, thought they were subhuman. They, 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 who cared about them? It was a Nietzschean society where, where the powerful survived and the weak went to the wall. And the church said, this is our treasure. And, and in a sense, so the church was speaking theologically. And, and frankly, we have the right to speak theologically. It's our language. It's how we look at the world. Um, and the moment we get engaged in a political conversation, well, then we've we've moved, if you like, out of not not our comfort zone exactly, but we've moved out of our worldview into another worldview. I wouldn't expect a Marxist to come and have a debate with me about the theological nature of of, of human disorder. What the heck could they they offer me in that debate? They they know nothing. Well, why on earth should, should Marxists expect Christians to get into the political debate and economic debate and, and, and have arguments about a poor poverty and oppression when we don't deal with those kind of categories? Because all those categories are subcategories of, of, of issues that we want dealing with further up near the source of the river. It's like saying, you know, it, it's like pollution. They're dealing with pollution down at the estuary. And we're saying it's too late. You've got to go to the spring. Someone is poisoning the water at the head. And, and, and there's no point whatsoever with our faffing around, picking up this toxic crap. It's already flowed right the way down through the river from the source. We go back to the source and we fix it there. So let's not... You know, the, 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 the Pope stuff, we're saying, let's clean the crap up at the estuary. It's too late. That's not where Christians well, work. I've, I've been feeling that way for a long time because I've, I've been in the, um, I'm in the Protestant world and I've been in evangelical churches for years. And um, I think somebody once used the term uh, therapeutic moralistic deism for, for what they yeah. teach often, because it's, you know, if you do ABC, then you're going to have better results in X, Y, and Z. And, um, and, and, when they talk about poverty, <clears throat> when they talk about poverty, well, first of all, I don't want to approach this as a political issue. I want to get to the root of the issue, which is, I think, this issue of sin. And um, I think that sin is one of those concepts that people so misunderstand, and they look at it as... Um, well... No, they don't know what they're looking at. The, re they, the reason they don't know what they're at looking words. at. But but let me go back to this thing about the what I see happening, at least in the Protestant church, is when they're serving the people, and and we do a lot of things to help people. We we have food drives, and we go out into the community, and we have weekends where we paint people's houses, and we we uh, we go in and we clean up areas that have gotten trashed, and we help the schools, and we we do a lot of these things. And we do a lot of things where we raise money for the poor. And, but in all of the things that we're doing, we're, we're nibbling away at the margins. But what, why isn't there teaching in the church about how to be a person who doesn't fall into poverty? Why isn't there teaching in the church about what there it is. means? So Paul, so Paul, so Paul talks about that. Yes. So Paul says, if you want to eat, you're going to have to go and get work for it. So Paul says about himself, I could have, I could have had you subsidize me, but I chose to work in order to set an example of what human dignity and human responsibility produces. It's, it's, it, it depends whether you read the Bible with a socialist spectacles or, or with, 
with capitalist spe- I mean, everything you know, we well, all come not, to the Bible. neither of those spectacles are important if what you're looking at it is through a lens of love for so no no, me, no, no, from, no 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 hold let me finish the thought here for me yeah. to look at it and say um he's poor because of sin that sounds like a judgment and it sounds like i'm putting myself above but for me to say we need teaching in the church about what it means to live a life where we don't fall into poverty or where we can earn enough extra that we can help other people. No, no, no. This is, this is that, this is that is not a judgment against the people who aren't doing that. That is looking at people who are in trouble, looking at them with a lens of love and saying, what can we do to actually make things better? What we do instead oh. is we follow the world and we try to follow the world's idea of what makes things better instead of getting only a, only a 20th century, late 20th century American could talk with such presuppositions. Nobody else would ever dream that you could control poverty or health because fate, um, the, we do not have control over over these external circumstances this is a this is a form of narcissistic overreach from from comfortable people you can't control poverty you you can't control your health you don't know you can't control your your circumstances you could end you know, you, you ought to read some 19th century novels by dickens or tolstoy to realize that as confucius say shit happens you've no control over it in your own life or anybody else's life the idea that you can somehow make nice in society by exercising conscience and being nice, it's it's ludicrous. I mean, it's it's such hubris. It, it just doesn't. Uh, well, then so, why so, was why was Paul talking about it in the scriptures? Then he wasn't talking about what you were talking about. What Paul oh. was talking about. You so you, you know, hang on. Our discussion went. You raised the so you said, wouldn't it be nice if people talked about responsibility within the Christian community? And I said, but they do. And I gave the example of St. Paul. And you then went on and you switched tracks and you then said. Oh, no, no, no. Well, I, I said in the Christian, in 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 the, the Protestant evangelical church, they're not talking about those things. Now, in, in your Christian community, maybe they do. Um, well, okay, leave, leave, let's not swap Christian communities at the moment. Let's, what, I, what I'd like to do instead is I'd, I'd like to get back to Jesus. Because, because very often, we're going back to the head of the river. So um, I'm not a morally therapeutic deist. Um, I, I'm I'm a, I'm a 20th century person who's looking at life through the eyes of Jesus. That that's what I try and do. Mm-hmm. So from time to time, Jesus was confronted with the issues that you and I are talking about. So, for example, you know, when it comes to the rights of Aborigines or first First Nation people, or or or, or people who suffered at the hands of colonialists. Jesus stepped right into those shoes when he had conversations about tax with the Romans. And he immediately sidestepped and said, I'm not going to answer your questions in the categories you present them to me. Who's, who's, t- whose coin is it? Caesar's? Give to Caesar's what's Caesar's. Give to God's what's God. Oh, my goodness. That's such a big problem. Now I have to work out what belongs to Caesar and what belongs to God. That's not an easy task. <laughs> That's a lifetime of working things through. But what he was doing was, I refused to buy into the expectations you bring in order to present the question to me. There was another one, a very famous one, when Pilate said, who the hell do you think you are? Or what's that effect? Um, and Jesus, Jesus sidetracked him because he didn't want to give... He knew, so Pilate was asking two questions. Pilate was sharp enough to know there was a political question and, and a metaphysical question. And when Pilate shifts to the metaphysical question, Jesus answered metaphysically, you would have no power if it had not been given to you from above. That's a metaphysical conversation. Are you the king of the Jews? That's a political conversation. Jesus very, very carefully um, responds to the categories that people present him. And he either accepts them and then says, we're talking the same thing, or he rejects them and uh, and does a sidestep. And one of his very clever lateral thinking things. Now, the the problem is, if you go back into the Gospels, you don't find social justice anywhere. It's just not there as a category. You find you find responsibility there. Lazarus and Dives, for example, the rich man is not entitled to ignore the man at his gate any more any more than than you're entitled to ignore the Samaritan lying in the you cannot ignore your neighbor. So, but but at all times, Jesus takes he takes the Peterson side more than the Pope Twitter side, because the cash value is always who is your neighbor. 
So um, I can do all kind. You know, I can give my money to all kinds of build a toilet in Africa, and I'm sure it's very good once the administrators have stopped taking their fees and spend money on publicity and insurance and other things. But actually, it's it, I have a real neighbour, and one of the reasons why I, I give money to people I pass in the street, irrespective of whether they're going to spend it on drugs or food, is that's my neighbour, and I and I feel I'm mandated to give. Now, is that political? Well, kind of, but it's certainly personal. But if you want me to give to a charity run by other people, I don't see any mandate as a Christian to do. I might want to do it as a nice person, as a responsible person, as a citizen of the world community, but not as a Christian. Because, because my Christian, the language of my, of my interaction with other people as a Christian inhabits a different zone. And it's not, that, it's not the political zone. Well, so could I just clarify that point for the folks who might be listening, at least as to yeah. the way I read what you're saying, and, and it would line up with what I think, is that I'm called to love my neighbor, I'm called to love the person who's in front of me who asks for help, I'm called um, to love the individuals that I meet and that are in my life and that are in my family, and, and, and but to say I love people or to say I love the world or to say I love the community or this particular community of people or this particular group to me is completely meaningless because if I can't love the person who's right in front of me, how can I love this group of people who don't even have a, a, a personal identity or personal relationship with me? But all of this identity stuff demands that you love a particular group of people or a particular category of people. But and they, it's they don't exist. But this, 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 this category doesn't exist. It's a construct of your imagination. It is quite impossible to love a group. I mean, let me give you an example. Let's say a group appeared out of my in front of my door. How many is a group? 15, 100, 200, 500. How would I love 500 people standing outside my door? It's nonsense. A person comes to my door, I can love that person. But then there's different kinds of love. If a person comes to my door and they're naked and I give them give them some clothes, well, I might just be buying off my conscience. Who's to say it's love when actually I'm a very complex person with complex motives? Um, the person might feel love, but I may just be buying them off. But equally, this may be somebody who's in a terrible relationship with themselves. Now, actually, what they need is forgiveness. They need to know that God loved them, made them, and wants to save them. Real love may not be giving them two sandwiches. It may be saying, how did you get to this place, and do you want to get out of it? Because God will take you out of it, but you'd have to find God. Every time I give money to a person on the street, all I do is trap them in their lifestyle. That's not love. That's selling my conscience. We shouldn't use these words so loosely. In fact, you know, I'd want to ban the word love in any of these things and, and talk entirely pragmatically. It's much, it's much too complex for that. Well, if, And if it's complex, even between one person and another, me and a tramp is already complex. By giving to the tramp, am I keeping them in that lifestyle? Am I subsidizing them so they never get free? Or should I actually be involved in some kind of personal relationship where I say, how? what can I do as a as 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 a as somebody to help you move out of this position, would you want to get out if I took you out? Because there's a real percentage of people who are there who don't want to get out because they don't want responsibility. I'm not I'm not doing that as a kind of you know right wing put down. I'm just saying it's more complex than that. Well, so I think it's why, this is why I think it's that we get into so much trouble when we throw it into a political arena because I'm perfectly happy to say about myself. That if somebody offered me money instead of me working, I would probably take advantage of that. I mean, I'm a sinner. So somebody offers me the easy way out, I'm going to take it. But that's not the easy way out for me, really, because then I'm not going to learn all the things that I would learn through the working. I wouldn't uh, gain the maturity and wisdom that I'll learn through facing difficulties in life. And, and so if I arbitrarily give to somebody because someone has told me that that's a good thing to do, I might actually be condemning that person to a loss of all these things, this riches that they might have in their relationship with Christ, that they'll never have because I bailed them out of this difficult situation, right? So, so you're quite right. So a lot of the time we talk about loving our neighbor. And what we're really talking about is making our feels, ourselves feel better about ourselves. 
because we have no idea what is going to happen to the neighbor. We don't know what they need. We never took the trouble to find out. It's a kind of gesture. It's a sort of gesture charity. Um, and, and we then go away feeling better and saying, well, I now, you know, I've loved my neighbor. There's terrible hubris in this. So I, I'm afraid I think this is all part of a kind of be nice society where we use language and concepts and, and political categories in order to make ourselves feel that we've taken the moral high ground of some kind. But again, as a Christian, you don't seek to do that. You can't fool God. You might fool yourself or your or your peer group, but you can't fool God about 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 yourself. I'm, I remember when I was a, I'd become an evangelical student, and I I met um, I met a couple who were homeless at church. I had two rooms, so I said, "Well, you better come home and live with me." I thought I was being a great Christian, and I kind of was. So they came, they came and they they were unemployed. They were kind of sort of hippie street people, and they they lived in my front room. And then they began to smoke drugs, and they stay there, and they showed no signs of going or doing anything about it. I began to be irritated them, and they wouldn't leave. At what at what point was this me loving my neighbour? I I miscategorized the whole thing, but in an effort to a see to a, appear loving to myself, I, I had I had taken a course of action that was entirely misinformed and a misjudgment about what was really going on. So sure, I could present myself as some kind of sacrificial social justice warrior um, who shared his largesse with people who had nothing. That wasn't really what was going on. So there's a, I, I, that's another reason for being very, very wary about all the social justice language, mm -hmm. which is kind and nice people wanting to feel better about themselves and wanting to make feel that they've made a difference, but actually misdiagnosing the enormous complexities of what's going on, both at the level of, of, of complex individuals and at levels of even more complex interactions between complex individuals, which is one of the reasons why, unlike Islam, Christianity is not a religion that does politics. Now, Islam does. Islam is a really sophisticated, complex interaction between spirituality and politics. It's got it worked out really very well. It's very impressive. But Christianity doesn't do that. In fact, what people are trying to do today is they're trying to Isla Islamize Christianity by making it a hybrid of, of spirituality and politics. But it's just it's not Islamic politics. It's kind of secular politics. Well, this is a dreadful perversion of what Jesus came to do. Um, you can't find any of this in the Gospels. Jesus shows no concern at all about ecology or equality or justice or the people who have control or the imperialists or colonialists. He, there's nothing there about any of that because all that stuff is at the estuary where the filth has gathered. He's concerned of going right back to the source where the soul has been perverted. And so he always goes to the point where where the soul has gone wrong and and you know it's with different different people it's different solutions so the woman at the well he he says you know well you've been having a great time with your personal relationships but now it's time to get real not not five husbands anymore um get to know the messiah with with one rich young man he says in order you're being trapped by this but only one of them he met lots of rich people nicodemus was stinking rich at no point when he's sitting down in John having a talk to Nicodemus about where the wind blows, did he say, by the way, mate, you've got too much money, you should give some away. And and, and yet, in, in the kind of crass stupidity of, of, of biblical interpretation, everyone grabs the rich young ruler and say, yeah, Jesus is a Marxist, he wants you to get rid of your wealth. No, that one man. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, am I the rich young ruler? If I'm the rich young ruler, I may have to give away all my money. Uh, am I Nicodemus? I may not have to give away my money. I may have instead to differ to, to to engage in an entirely different paradigm of thinking with the world, because Jesus tells me my paradigms are wrong. That was the thing with Nic and, you know, Nicodemus does, and in the end, it's he gives his tomb to Jesus. But but at every point, Jesus has a different diagnosis and a different solution for different modes of being. And it, we can't just take an example out of the Gospels and then project and say, this is some form of universal template because, because it happens to fit in with my political predispositions. So the, the, the way we come to the Bible is a, it's not even intellectually more complex. It's, it's, it's spiritually much more complex. It requires an act of discernment. And it's absolutely personalist. In that sense, Jordan is quite right. When you come to the Bible, 
you're not just reading the Bible to decide what principles you want other people to adopt politically. The Bible is reading you. The Bible judges you. The Bible interrogates you when you read something. And you really shouldn't be telling everybody about it. It's not their business. You should be letting the Bible, the, the Holy Spirit through the Bible interrogate you and, and, and then begin to change the sin in your life. And at that point, you then reduce some of the weight of sin in the body politic. But if it doesn't begin with you, it's not going to last and it's not going to have any effect. It's just more you, you just used the word personalist. And um, I I hear people making a I think I said personalize. Oh, okay. But, okay. but yeah, anyway. Because I hear people making a distinction between individualism and personalism. And have you run into this idea of personalism? As being yes, but I'm not individualism yes but 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 uh, again everything depends upon your terms um uh i mean for example in 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 um i'm i'm much more familiar with with psychological terms and so you know if i was going to talk about the human person i think the place i'd want to go to first of all would be freud because i really like the map that freud gave us I like the map of of the split personality between between the the ego struggling impotently in what what we understand to be consciousness desperately trying to arbitrate between two impersonal unconscious false per, 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 uh, forces of the of the super ego and the id. I think it's absolutely brilliant. It doesn't tell the whole truth about people, but but if you're going to be talking about about the individual, then I'd want to talk about consciousness and unconsciousness and, and between the forces that uh, become integrated or disintegrated. Um, so we can all um, dissect our categories within different areas of expertise. But in a sense, this is just fiddling while Rome burns. You can have any argument you like about it. But, but, but the, the point about being a Christian is we're trying to take people to the source of the difficulty. And and none of the, as a Christian, I've looked at the different social programs, intellectual programs, educational, philosophical, um, and none of them compares to putting my hand myself into the hands of the living God in repentance and asking him to forgive me and to, to change me. That's made a difference in the world in my life. Um, I remember my sisters used to say, it's such a good thing you became a Christian. You would have been unbearably horrible. And and you know if you hadn't if you hadn't become a Christian and some people look at me and say you know Gavin you're not a very nice person you I suspect you could be you could be, you know you have latent violence issues oh they're so they're so right the number of people I might have killed or wounded if I not been a Christian because I'd have taken their bloody heads off in a fit of fury and and power is endless I haven't hit anybody because I'd become a Christian I can tell you now if I hadn't become a Christian I'd have hit many people on the way. On this journey, so whatever people might say in terms of their, their criticism of me, you've no idea how worse I would have been if Jesus had not got his hands on me and began to restrain and change and transform me. So, so um, I'm very unimpressed with with solutions that don't involve this surrender to the living God, who has a who has a his program is to begin to reorder who we are. It's a very, very serious and ambitious program of reordering. And when it works, it's like nothing else. I think it was, yeah, it was Peterson again. It happens with P.P. Peterson. I'm not quoting him on purpose, but, but I remember him saying, about the only place where I, I think it was Peterson. It might have been William James. I think it's Peterson. The only place where I think, uh, he was talking about addiction and alcoholism and saying that the only solution to alcoholism was, was the miracle of faith. Almost nothing else had ever worked to help someone deal with this particular craving. But there were a category of people who said that they'd been healed by God and behaved as though they'd been healed. Um, I'm overlapping with William James because William James says something similar about the miraculous and uh, assessing the claims of the metaphysical by people's behavior. But but what I'm trying the, the point I wanted to make was that um, that the ambitions of that, that the ambitions of God for people for individuals are are without limit. He wants to 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 change us in the most profound way, and the reason that we don't buy into revolutionaries 
rhetoric or vision politically is because there's a much bigger revolution that needs to take place near the head of the river, at the source, in the individual. Now, if you can have this revolution take place in individuals, have it take place within 10 individuals, 100, 1,000, 10,000, and then you've got a social revolution. And, and one of the reasons why I wanted to be an evangelist and not a social activist was because if I can bring 10,000 people to Jesus and they all submit to this extraordinary this extraordinary operation of transformation that the Holy Spirit has, then we've got 10,000 people who are behaving very differently in the body politic. That's that's something to be go for. But if you tinkle with the superficialities, if you go for social justice, for egalitarianism, for the redistribution of, of, of stuff, all you're doing is you're just tickling the symptoms. And and as, as Peterson says, with the Pareto curve, even if you do it in one generation, you'll be back to where you were in the next generation. Because you you had to do it when you when you stop your influence and your control, all the human stuff that made it like that in the first place reasserts itself. So even all social justice is only good for a generation, and then you've got to start again. Whereas the Christian revolution is is permanent. Even if you could possibly say that the social justice thing is good for a generation, probably not even then. Um, but in your article one of the things that you brought up was liberation theology and yeah. that um really struck a nerve for me because when i was a new believer back in the early 1980s i had the opportunity to sit at the feet of a tremendous teacher um he was a missionary in colombia and had been for a number of years and then he had come back to oxford to get a doctorate and he purposely did his doctorate in liberation theology so that he could combat what was happening in South America, where liberation theology had come in and begun basically to destroy all of the evangelical churches there, because they were coming in saying, there's a much easier answer than this whole business of giving your life to Christ. Let's all get together and do revolution. And, uh, yeah. and there are so many people today that still think that liberation theology is a good thing. I, I know young people who've been going to a Catholic university nearby here, and one of the classes that they have to take is liberation theology because it's part of the church and it's part of the teaching of the church. And that was very puzzling to me because I thought that we had figured all that stuff out 45, 50 years ago, right? Well, we, we actually we'd figured it out a great deal longer than that because it's, it's the same question that simply represents itself in every generation, I mean, liber liberation theology was very seductive. And I, 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 one of the first things I began to do on being becoming an evangelical Christian was I began to read about Christian Marxism. I thought if I can combine these two things together, whoa, how cool would that be? How cool and how effective revolution at every level. This, you know, why stop with one revolution when you can have two or three um, at and it probably took me about 40 years to really work my way through this seduction and to see that actually I was being seduced. Uh, I was being seduced away from, well, the, the first of all, it's much easier to be an authority on politics and economics than it is to be an authority on the soul. To be an authority on the soul is a very, very difficult thing to do. It requires spiritual gifts. It requires prayer. It requires self-denial. It requires maturity. It takes a long time. Well, anybody can be an authority politically or economically in five minutes. Ask any teenager. And so, so of course, it's my, why not go for the easy area than the hard area? Where And anyway, if you're an authority on the soul, nobody else knows but you. There's no kudos to be had in it. You don't go around saying, hey, I've got a PhD in spirituality and look at me, I'm I'm a really, it doesn't work like that. All that happens is you you get to know levels of your shittiness that are really quite, quite problematic. And why would you go around saying, hey, look at me, I'm a real shit. I've discovered how complex and conflicted and I am, how self-delusory I am. No, nobody wants to be a doctor of the soul when they can be a doctor of philosophy or economics or politics. So that's the seduction. It's much easier to get involved in the external revolution than, than, than the internal revolution. And then in the end, you discover that who is the internal revolution going to be, going to affect? And the answer is, you don't do it to other people as a sign of your moral superiority. You do it to yourself as a sign of your moral inferiority. Well, who wants to do that? 
So of course, everyone's into liberation theology. It's such an easy way out. Well, I, when you were talking about <clears throat> how shitty we can find we find out that we are, I was thinking back to when I was a fairly new believer. Um, I was at some kind of conference and I was sitting next to this guy at dinner and I was really on fire for the Lord. So even then I was just telling everybody about it. And, uh, and he said, well, what is the main thing that you've learned since you became a Christian? And I said, oh, I, I just become so aware of my own sin. And he said, well, then that's not for me. He said, I'm already very aware of my own sin. He said, I don't want to know anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. so instead of instead of getting him interested in Christ, I had actually kind of maybe for a moment closed the door. But I just no, no, no. But you know, you, you 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 didn't at all. He he, you both knew what you were talking about, and he. Yes. But 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 essentially, you were saying. I, I've discovered my levels of disorder and dysfunctionalism. And because I've discovered them, I've handed them over to Christ and he's begun to deal with them. And it's a, it's it's the most intense sacrifice of the ego. It's the thing that Jesus was talking about, about crucifying yourself and picking up your cross. It's one of the most, it is probably, it is the most difficult thing any human being has to do. So you were saying, here is this the most difficult thing any human being has to do. I've done it and I've started the road and it's amazing. And he was saying, that's too difficult for me. That's just too difficult. I've already got a sense of how difficult that was. I'm not even going to try it. So, you know, you weren't, he knew what you were talking about. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, and, you didn't I mean, and, 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 and as you said, the interesting thing is that the longer you walk with the Lord, the more you see and the more you oh, see well, what, yourself and, and your internal disorder. and uh... <clears throat> Well, and again, I got it wrong when I was a young Christian. I I genuinely thought that being a Christian was a bit like a gym. And, and, and the more I went to gym and combated sin, the more muscular I would become, the more saintly I would become, the more I would begin to overcome this stuff. What, what I didn't realize was, <laughs> and this has really pissed me off growing older as a Christian, that that I've discovered the moral struggle is gets harder as you get older, not easier. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, what's that about? I didn't sign up for I signed up to win this thing. And what I discover is that every time I think I'm getting somewhere, a bigger trap, a bigger problem, a bigger complexity, a bigger temptation. I mean, it's like, <laughs> you think, well, when, when will this ever end? And the answer is it won't. The, the, the answer is that, I mean, our Lord invites us into this, very serious struggle with real evil masquerading as good and and real disorder masquerading as us and he asks us to fight to the end indeed he, he says he who endures to the end will be saved this this is an endurance race it's a marathon and you know you may be you may feel good after five miles but there's going to be a wall at 21 miles and I think I think you know you could use a marathon analogy for the Christian go. You know, there you go. You keep going. You've done twenty-one miles with Jesus. Look at me. I'm still running. And now the wall of pain comes. Well, who expected that? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I've I've found I've been doing this. I've, you know, if, if a year of my life is equivalent to to a mile, you know, I'm I'm in mile forty-five or something, and it never gets easier. At no point have I begun to win the fight. And, and what that means is, first of all, you have nothing to boast about. You have no way of looking down at anybody else. And secondly, it throws you to your knees every single night. But that's the only thing that keeps you clean as a Christian. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. You know, the Orthodox are right. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's the, it's the best, one of the best prayers there is. And so even as a Christian, one has to learn what, what we're doing. And it, Actually, that you know that takes time. Another reason why so many people have given up being Christians whilst they're Christians, and taken up the whole social activist thing is because it's easier. It's very, 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 very hard being a Christian and keeping going being a Christian. I mean, do 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 do, we, do people really think that turning the cheek for the fifty-fifth time is as hard as turning it for the second time? The second time was easy, and even then it was impossible. But the fifty-fifth time. 
<laughs> Lord, how many times must I forgive my neighbor? I'll go big, Lord. I imagine unimaginably big, seven times. No, 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 no. Count to 48 and keep going. <laughs> This Christianity thing, it's its its really, its you know, the guy who's sitting next to you at the table, he knew what he was doing. It's not for me. It's too difficult. And so it's much, much easier. I could have a ball being a gender warrior. I could feel, I get to feel so good about myself. I tell other people how to live their lives. I'd have a position of moral superiority and influence. Uh, and, and, and all the way through, all of us would, would, labor under the illusion I had it right and the world was going to be a better place. That's such a nice place to be. And it's such baloney. It isn't true. So in a sense, that was also what Peterson was saying to the Pope. He, he was saying, you need to get saved. <laughs> That's the revolution. Get saved. Well, I, I think one of the other things that Peterson is always saying, and I have a hard, kind of a hard time putting it into words, but there is a reality that's real. And, and it, you can't mess with it. You can't twist the fabric of reality and not expect it to bite. But um, so much of what's happening in the world today is, well, I have my utopian vision. You have your utopian vision. We should all be able to live our utopian vision. But that's not the way the world is constituted. So what are you going to do with all your utopian visions? Right. Well, that, that's why I was a bit sort of edgy about you saying, you know, we, we can make everyone's life safe and nice, which yeah, is just a form. What, by the way, that's not what I said. That's what you heard. No, no. Because you <laughs> talk to a lot of people who talk that way. So, but I mean, the people who listen to my channel all the time know that that's not what I was saying. I'm, I, I'm so please, I apologize. Yeah, I, I, was, I, was, I was more talking like the way, the way Jordan always talks about how, um, Yes, stuff happens, and we, we can't do anything about the stuff that happens. But what we can do something about is the way that we are personally responding to things and taking care of our own little world to some extent. You know, I can get up early in the morning instead of laying in bed all day. That's one thing that I can do that, that's going to give me a little bit better shot at having a life, right? So, um, and I think, I think Peterson, you're, you're quite right. And I think Peterson is very sensibly, as a psychologist, saying, before you sort out the very complex mess of other people, you need to you need to have some sense of your own mess and you know tidy your room. Well, I could still learn to tidy my room. Uh, I, I actually, it's it's. I think it's even more it's even more significant than Peterson knows because I think tidiness and order are actually a spiritual virtue and they're part of this revolution that needs to take place inside. I think the way we use time as well as use, we use things, this this ordering of things instead of disordering things does really manifest itself in the environment we live in. I'm always I'm always a bit worried about the fact that I'm not very good at managing my environment, and I I suspect that that, that it's a it's a sort of projected expression of of my internal environment, um, and so you know I think Peterson is right saying. Just deal with your own environment. And, and, and if and when you've managed that, that will give you a platform to interest yourself in somebody else's. But the truth is, very few of us manage that. I mean, I, I remember, you know, an example. I remember the epi, epi, epidemiolo epidem epidemiologist who, who um, was advising COVID uh, rules in Great Britain uh, and telling everyone uh, all about separation and lockdown. And, and, and every night was driving across London to make love to his mistress. <laughs> and so, <laughs> well, of course he was, because that's how people are. But he wasn't presenting himself like that. He was presenting himself as, as the high priest of, of orderly, civilized political behavior and lived this completely different life. Well, I know when I look at a politician or a, or a director of a charity or somebody who sets himself up as being something big in the public space, I already know that they have a double life. It's no surprise to me. Uh, it, it might be a surprise to them, but that's how humanity is. And once again, what, what Jesus says is, come come to me and let me deal with your double life. And that's, you know, that's the source of the river. That's that's where the spring is. And that's why anything down, I, I remember I, I deliberate, one of the reasons when people say, why are you becoming a priest instead of a lawyer? Is because and it was, it's slightly, slightly um, facile, but nonetheless, 
I said, lawyers always get to the human condition after the crash. They do a great job in fixing up, you know, in dealing with, with after the crash. But I think as a priest, I'm going to have the opportunity to deal with things before the crash. I remember one guy in the, in the poor part of London when I was a curate came to me uh, and said, uh, he knelt down before me one day, he's about an 18 year old drug addict. And he said, father, pray for me, I've got an addiction. I thought, what do you expect me to do for you? So I laid hands on him and I prayed for him. I felt so inadequate. About four months later, I discovered he'd become a complete hero at Cambridge University, where he was going around the Christian Union explaining that God had done this amazing miracle and delivered him from drugs. I never got any credit. <laughs> I, I would have liked some credit for that. I never got any. I'm the man of prayer who did this thing. I got written out of the whole thing, which was, a, which was good. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was an example of one person's life. But the next, the next thing I did was I went to the police because this, so this guy, this guy then came to me and said, "Gav, I'm, I'm off drugs and I'm trying, I'm trying to earn a living, but the police keep arresting me, and 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 they bring false charges against me." So I went to the police locally as the priest, the social justice priest, and I said to the police, "Lay off my mate because he's 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 clean, he's come good." They said, yeah, look, he's been a villain since he's nine. We've known this boy since he was nine. We, we don't believe he's come good. But even if he has, we're arresting him for all that stuff he did between nine and 18 when he didn't come good and we never got him. Oh, no. Wow. You want justice? We're doing justice. Every time he's still getting away with so much more than we're, we're pinning on him. And I, I came back and I thought, in terms of the police that, you know, that was not unreasonable. They were dealing with some really quite dangerous people. And they, I saw their point, but I couldn't persuade them that a miracle had happened to his soul. Um, and so, you know, uh, I still think that laying hands on him and praying for his deliverance was much more effective than any organizing of drug programs or police rehabilitation or or um, safeguarding for, for the police. You know, not, not, that was all just dealing with the superficialities and the fact that life is more complex. He had a past, my friend. They, they were catching up for his past. It wasn't unreasonable. <laughs> Unfair. Well, the thing I like but... about that story is that, first of all, your self-deprecation... <laughs> that you recognize how funny it is that we we should think that we get any credit for any of these things but 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 also the fact that you stood there you knew you didn't have an answer for him you personally had no answer what are we going to do somebody's got this problem what you can do is let god speak through you and you put your hands on him and let god do his work and uh i think i mean all of my life one of my big struggles has been that I feel like I need to solve everybody's problems. And if I can't, then I'm actually the one who's causing their problems. I, mean, I remember even during the Kuwait war, I somehow had the feeling that I had, because I couldn't solve the war, that it was my fault that, it, that we're having a war in the first place. And it took me a long time to come to the place of recognizing he is God, I am not. <laughs> and he's well, and the also one who's, of... who's fixing these, he's the one who's working on these things, but. I can be available sometimes and be there, be his voice, be his hands, be his feet or whatever. But, um, but it's never me. And well, it's really hard when people come up to you and say, Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I'm like, thank you for <laughs> what I didn't do anything except just be a body in, in the place, you know? And also you quickly realize one, one realizes there's no such thing as an altruistic act. We, you know, you were saying, if I heard you rightly, I'm partly doing these things to feel better about myself, and and you know, by fixing your life, it's no longer maybe it's no longer my fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but but and and that's not unreasonable. And a lot of people's ethics spring from that perfectly kind instinct. But the fact is, is just, as you discover if you spend any time in therapy. Um, that actually trying to fix other people's life as a substitute for dealing with our own insecurity, disorder, dislike, shame, insecure, you know, whatever. It, it, it's once again, we're like cleaning up the stuff at the, at the estuary. It's you're dealing with the symptoms and not the cause. And a good therapist 
will try to stop you sorting out other people's lives by helping you come to terms with your own motivation and and dealing with the real source of the problem. And you know, it's quite it's quite possible. Mean, there's, there's a lovely uh, lovely verse in C.S. Lewis talking about um, this this very moral woman. Uh, and you always knew who she'd be moral and kind to because they wore a kind of hunted look. <laughs> and, is that in the great so, divorce? I think it's in the great divorce. I think <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's, my, it's almost my favorite book. I um, read that every three or four years just to remind myself of what I don't want to become. <laughs> it's such a profound. It's such a profound book. At every single, see, and 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 then again, one of the reasons Lewis is so powerful is because he refuses. To be distracted from the from the task of becoming a doctor of the soul, and so all through the Narnia books and through his theological books, every time he takes he takes us to the source of the and invites us to confront it, and that's one of the reasons why people still go on reading him. He doesn't deal with the symptoms; he deals he deals with with the source, you uh, know, in, in a way that helps us see ourselves uh, and and face up to the to the difficulty of seeing ourselves. But if we can see ourselves through Christ's eyes, you know, maybe we can, maybe we can, we can manage it. You know, we we manage the process, and that, you know, again, that's why I'm I'm a Christian. I'm 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 not interested in self examination. I, I, you know, like you, what what's down there doesn't bear looking at some of it. And God saved me from justice on the last day. But but if I can come to to Christ as the paralytic let down through the roof by my friend's prayers. Or if I can come to him as as the grateful leper, or you know Mary Magdalene out of her mind with demons, whatever, then you know, then then I get made well. And the, the the reason I'm in love with Jesus is because I just don't see anybody else in the whole of human history in the human imagination who who does what he does with such effect. Yeah, or the tax collector at the temple saying, "God have mercy on me, a sinner." Totally. You know, I'm there. I'm absolutely there. Yeah. Or or even, even Matthew climbing the tree saying, get out of my way. I need to keep I need to keep an eye on this thing. This is interesting. <laughs> What's get, get out of my way? I can't see. I, I need to know. I remember once uh, where I I, I I was in in a possession of the Blessed Sacrament. And uh, and suddenly this very nice pilgrim woman from Ireland began to scream and blaspheme because she had a demon inside her. I didn't believe in demons at the time. I just elbowed people out of my way saying, I need to see this. I need to see why this perfectly sensible, nice woman in her 30s on a pilgrimage is, is blaspheming oaths against Jesus when all that happened was this piece of magic cardboard passed within eight feet of her. You know, this this so breaks down all my presuppositions. Um, and, you know, I, I discovered two things. A, there were demons, and B, Jesus was in the cardboard. <laughs> this... But but you know, like Matthew, I had to climb the tree. Get out of my way! I need to know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I I mean, I think that um, one of Satan's biggest tricks is convincing us that he he doesn't exist because we're so sophisticated in the West, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, but the, and, and the, the trouble is who worked in South Africa and South America and, you know, um, the Southeast Asian islands, the folks there aren't so sophisticated and they're perfectly aware that there are spiritual powers that we know, we know very little of here in this country. It's taken so, me I mean, we so long. See the effect, but we call it some psychiatric thing instead of a, yeah. a, a demonic thing. It's and it's taken me so long to shift out of the the normal paradigms of the Western intellectual into the much more difficult and elusive paradigms of of the world of the spirit that Jesus was inviting Nicodemus to enter by by being born again. It's a very very hard journey. So again, no wonder people go for the simple political, economic, and social options of fixing things because. Going on the inner journey is really, it's difficult. It takes a long time. It's one of the hardest things to do. You're the problem, not the solution. And, and um, well, I, I think, the, you know, the length of time, it, it's, um, it, it's, it requires a lot of patience and a lot of endurance. Why? So well, why wouldn't you go for the quick fix? One of the other things that you have uh, personal knowledge of is 
to what extent a person can study philosophy and get all wound up in the academics of theology and philosophy and uh, kind of miss the, the boots on the ground experience of actually putting our lives into Jesus' hands, very simply letting him work on us day by day. That the, 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 world, of, the world of academic and intellectual arena is is just the gladiators arena it's just everyone saying my sword is bigger than you i'm going to beat you i'm cleverer faster and 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 if you know that's the world of academia then it's okay we mustn't ever fool ourselves that that as we you know it's part of the enlightenment trick that somehow being clever being informed or being intelligent conveys virtual wisdom it's often exactly the opposite but still, you know, and, and yet it's up, and yet all the left, the left activists keep on saying, let's educate people. <laughs> As if, you know, we we live in the most educated world we ever have. And the more we get educated, the more crazy it gets. And still they cry, let's educate people. And, and without any sense that this is the most dreadful form of misdiagnosis of a hubristic kind. Well, clearly, Western education of the gladiatorial type that makes itself most sophisticatedly experienced at universities, that doesn't do the trick. Something else is required. Well, and the other thing is the whole issue of scalability. I mean, and forgive me for using this kind of language. It's the kind of language that our little corner has gotten into. But some of the wisest people that I have ever met that have had tremendous impact on my spiritual life have been people that were what other people would call simple or um, mentally handicapped. Uh, but because uh, because of their walk with Christ and the solidity of their relationship with him, they had so much wisdom to share with me. Um, of course. <clears throat> and so I know that there's a lot. I mean, philosophy is fascinating, but that's not where the answers are. <laughs> one of the most one of the most um, powerful people I ever met was Peggy. Peggy was a murderess. She went to prison for life because she blew off her love. Of her, she had a faceless lover who two-timed her, and she took a shotgun to him and blew his head off. And uh, she went to prison for life. And, <laughs> and Peggy was a nice bourgeois middle-class woman, and her family were very embarrassed that they had a, a murderess in the family. And then so Peggy went to Holloway in London and, uh, and was there for about 30 years. And then she got terminal cancer. And just as she got just as she got terminal cancer, she began to she began to read the Bible with a chaplain, and in the process of her cancer being treated, she 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 came to Jesus, and then um, and then the the cancer got was terminal, and the Home Secretary released her to die in the community, which was really awkward because that meant going home to her sister, who really didn't like her, was so didn't want anybody to know that her that that she had a relative who was a in prison for murder. And uh, Peggy was sent to me by the bishop because she wanted me to hear her confession and to have her confirmed and, and to be with her. And, and we became great friends. And she said to me, but whatever happened, she said, promise me I can die in your arms. Just just be there to hold me as I die, please, as my priest. And I, I said, yes, absolutely. And um, And several very interesting things happened. First of all, Peggy was luminous, so much so that when we wheeled her around church in her wheelchair, I actually had people saying to me, why have you organized for a spotlight? We had a kind of theater church. It was half church, half, half public arena, half sanctuary. And so, you know, people played badminton and we had amateur dramatics. And somebody and she came to me and said, who's putting the spotlight on that lady? Why is she, why they genuinely thought she'd been, because she was glowing. And, and, and it's not, there are no lights on. It's Jesus inside her. How can Jesus be inside this? He's only been a Christian six months. Well, you know, and the answer was, I, th I think the answer was, she had given herself so much to Jesus. She'd just given him everything. And he he had formed himself in her in a way that was simply radiant. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was very beautiful. Um, and in fact, I had one of my strangest spiritual experiences um, because uh, I, was, I, I had a deal with her sister. And I said, you know, when Peggy dies, you need to ring me, and wherever I am, I'll come. I promise to be there. And I was washing up one day in Lent, and I suddenly got a kick in my bottom, a literal a kick, you know, like someone had kicked me out the backside. And I, and, you know, I said, I said to God, "Hey, hey, 
because there was nobody else there. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's this all about? I've done nothing wrong. It's Lent, you know. I'm I've got clean hands. I've cleaned my act up. It's Lent, so so you know you haven't got anything on me. Like what was that about? And so I kind of went through the possible things, you know, my 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 personal sins, my worst sins, you know. And I went, oh God, it's Peggy. And I ran out the door and I sprinted a mile to her house and I banged on the door and her sister came to the door distraught. I said, why didn't you phone me? And I just ran upstairs and then she was dying and, and the Holy Spirit allowed me to keep my promise to her. And actually it wasn't a nice death. I, I mean, I, I would have thought, you know, um, she choked to death with, with fluid in her lungs and I held her while she did and prayed over her and, um, it wasn't as effective as my prayers for the man with the drug habit. It was, it was a, it was really hard, and I, I thought, well, this isn't fair, Lord. Where's the blessing? Where's, you know, where... <laughs> um, but but this was this was real biological entropy doing what it does, and sometimes we have to wade through shit, and Jesus is with us, and He doesn't take it away. He gets us to the other side, and this was a really horrible example of that. So, you know, but at the same one in the same time, he sometimes answers prayers and changes circumstances, and he sometimes journeys with us through the circumstances. And we have to be willing to accept whichever he does. Um, but as I remember you were telling that story, um, popped into my mind the night that my father died. Um, he had become a Christian just about two months before. Wow. Yeah. And um, because of just because of the way that Medicare works and everything and some weird rule, the doctor wouldn't allow him to be in the hospital when he started going downhill because if he didn't last at least, I think it was if he didn't last at least 72 hours and they had hospitalized him, then the doctor would be on some sort of list with the government for six months and in. I don't know what it all was. Anyway, they wouldn't put him in the hospital. So he was at home with me. And in the middle of the night, he started um, vomiting blood, this kind of bloody coffee grounds kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, it was really, really hard time. And I didn't have anybody there to help me. And I'm with him alone trying to manage. He was a big man. Yeah. And uh, at one point, all I could do was put my arms around him. And I started to sing, Jesus loves me. This I know. Right. And he just came alert instantly. And he said, I knew you were going to sing that. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. And because he came to the Lord in such an amazing way. It's a long story, but for the very short line of it is that he had become kind of mentally incomprehensible very quickly because of some physical problems. And when I came back to see him the next day in the middle of the night, he, well, anyway, he, he was perfectly uh, lucid when I came back to see him the next day. And he said in the middle of the night, God had met him with a vision of the foundations of the world and had shown him the entire history since the beginning in this vision. And then he began to talk about how much he loved jesus and how jesus had forgiven him just out of the blue this vision completely transformed him from an angry racist atheist hostile man into this man who just spoke the name of jesus with such love and grace that's quite and, a revolution uh, yeah it was it's really something i i think that's fantastic much to be thankful for well this has been an absolutely amazing conversation, Gavin. I'm so thankful that you joined me. Um, maybe it was a little rocky at the beginning because you didn't know where I was coming from. <laughs> it's, it was. It was wasn't rocky. I mean, if it was rocky, it's because I, I failed to follow your conversation. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I I, I, I tried to catch up. <laughs> well, I know, but I mean, you're often in these kind of situations where they bring you in as the adversary which is really unfair <laughs> because why not bring you in as somebody who has something to offer you know um but, it well, but it's, a lot such, of too. It, it's such an opportunity i i i'm so grateful um 
and to be given any opportunity at all to to try and speak something of God's insight, truth into our predicament so that maybe someone somewhere gets to hear the 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 um, the answer i mean it's it's you know I, I there'll be a point coming soon in our culture where they won't allow christians on any kind of christian for anything so um i'm just very grateful that from time to time i get to speak to to a wider audience and and with the help of the holy spirit because without it nothing happens um to say something on Jesus's behalf, to shift the paradigms, not not to show that I'm winning an argument, or that I'm better or cleverer or wittier, or, but but to try and shift the paradigms of the of the social discourse, which I think is is the first thing we have to do. Maybe maybe if only just to stop to make people think and think. Actually, this whole moral structure I think I've adopted, which makes me feel good, may not be what it seems to be, and that that would be a real achievement. That's what sort of pre-John the Baptist thing. <laughs> well, and in that vein, I will also uh, post the article that you wrote in the Catholic Herald about the Jordan Peterson issue. Um, sure, thank you. Because I thought you had a lot of really good things in there to say. And since we didn't really talk about that today, I'll post the article sure. in the description. That's very kind. Thank you very much. Well, yeah. Well, as always, it's lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Lovely to talk with you too, Gavin. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. God bless you and everyone listening. Bye for now. Bye.